So thank you again for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here with friends and make new friends, and, and I'm very happy. If you thought the first talk was interesting, wait till you see this one. <laughs> There's a reason I'm here again and not Pedro. Um, again, I'm going to try to give, this is my view. Uh, we've discussed this at length at our own institution, so I'm going to show you stuff that we've discussed and how we approach it, my view of the trial. I was already very aware of the trial because I'm on the, actually the relapse review committee for the LAC trial. And so that, for the, that committee is myself, uh, your own Greg Nelson, and Dave Sabula from Romania. So the three of us were well aware of uh, what was going to be presented at SGO when it was. So our, the blow was softened for the three of us, but still was a blow. Again, my disclosures, we went through that. We were all happily doing MIS rat hits for many years, you know, and lots of folks were publishing their retrospective data um, looking at all forms of MIS rat hiss, uh, batch hiss, straight laparoscopic rat hiss, robot, combos, whatever. And basically the five-year disease-free and, and overall survivals were no different. And so we felt reassured that we were doing the right thing. And I go to work every day to help people. I definitely don't go to work to kill anybody. So, you know, that's, you know, what I do. And I felt reassured that we were doing something. And I do think we offer a benefit with MIS. So, um, so we were doing it, just happily doing it all, all along. Then came this sad day um, in 2018 in, in New Orleans. Thank God it was New Orleans, so I was able to have fun and forget it afterwards. <laughs> but uh, I've, I was very well aware of this trial before it came out, because again, like as I mentioned, I was on the review committee, so I have all the recurrences on my laptop I can't share, but I can tell you there's issues with some of those things too, and there will be a publication on the specific to the recurrence, details of the recurrences that were noted. And then this was published in England Journal of Medicine. I actually have a copy of this signed by Pedro on my office wall on a dartboard. No, it's, it's actually framed. It's actually framed. And uh, I do think this is an important study. It is a landmark. If you look up a definition of a landmark article, this is that I did a recent editorial in Gynecologic Oncology, which I tell the landmark has been set. What do we do now? Um, because it has affected practice. And that's the definition of a landmark article. And I'm kind of jealous. It's in the New England Journal. You know, wish it was a different finding, but, you know, I'm still jealous. So for those of you who don't know the LAC, which would be living under a rock, I guess, but um, this was the um, eligibility. They were supposed to be uh, squamous cell adeno, adeno squamous only, 1A1 with LVS. Your typical, what we would accept as candidates for surgery, right? Um, they're, you know, surgical trials are very difficult. You know, surgery is not a drug. I don't care. The outcomes are different. Techniques are different. You can't say that surgery by one person is the same as surgery by another, unfortunately. But, and then how do you decide who's qualified to enter patients? You're not doing PK studies. You know, you're not making sure the drug is the same. So, you know, they try to account for this by saying that every person, every site had to submit outcomes from their 10 laparoscopic robotic cases. One could argue is that enough. And then two unedited videos. I don't know about you guys, but when I show a video or if I'm going to submit a video, it's going to be the damn best case I ever did with tumor spillage not in sight. So, you know, is that the right way to qualify surgeons for entering a trial? I don't know. But, you know, the ideal situation would be to videotape every case as you enroll. Then we could have gone back and seen in the recurrences what happened with the technique. But that's, we're actually doing another trial right now that's being developed. It'll be funded by Intuitive. It's at our, our GOG Partners Cooperative Group right now. And we talked about videoing every case, but there's a cost and logistical problem with that. So as much as I wanted to have that, we probably won't have that. But it all comes down to the dollars. If you guys want to send us some Canadian dollars for the trial, I'll take it. <laughs> and we'll do the video aspect. <laughs> uh, and they excluded the obvious stuff there. Uh, it was a non-inferiority design. So, you know, Keep this in mind as you see the results. Are based on all the prospective trials from GOG and everything else in cervix, they expected that the disease-free survival in the open arm would be 90%. That's what we had as data. So that's the background. So there's already an expectation that the open arm would have had a 90% DFS. They would have accepted a 7% difference. So when people look at their own data and there's a 2% difference, like, oh, there's a difference. No, but that would have been acceptable in, in this design. So up to 7% difference would have been considered non-inferior. So they had initially a total of 740 patients for a power of 87%. Now, for non-inferiority trials, you always want a higher power because you're usually looking for something that's less toxic, but you want the same outcome. So that's why you don't see an 80% power. You usually see 90% because you really want to make sure that your findings are correct and that you don't have a false, false negative. Does that make sense? So, I mean, you don't want to say that it's not inferior when it really is 
it's, it's a lot of double negatives, just trust me. You want a higher power. So this was the trial. Um, these patients were randomized to either total abdominal hysterectomy or total laparoscopic slash robotic. Uh, this was uh, terminated by a disease safety monitoring committee when they noticed that there was a signal of something bad happening. So a criticism now is that the trial was terminated early. That's not a criticism. It was terminated appropriately. It's valid. The LAC trial in, is, has strong internal validity. Scientifically, everything about it is correct. Okay, so you can't use that. We may want to argue that the surgeons may have sucked that enrolled, but I don't think we can do that either fairly because we didn't see every video. I haven't seen all these surgeons operate. So I don't think that's a valid criticism either. It might be something we think, but you know, objectively, you can't really say that. Um, so this was appropriately terminated, so it's valid. It's an appropriate termination of the study. The findings are valid even though it didn't go to 700 cases or whatever they wanted initially. And you can see here, now, I don't know if you're all aware, but there was New York Times, you know, I work in Manhattan, New York Times is our mortal en enemy. Um, you know, this whole thing, the FDA came out that robotic surgery is bad and this and that, and the New York Times that were killing people with robot hysterectomies. Only 15% of these cases were robotic. This has nothing to do with robotics specifically. This is a MIS. There was no New York Times article on laparoscopy killing people. It was all about robot. So again, the perspectives are always skewed. So this is what it was. This is the final number of cases in there. These are the post-op histologic characteristics. Now, people say, you know, the grade's not reported in 30%. That's another criticism. Well, if you have no residual in about 20% of cases, there's no grade. <laughs> there's no tumor to grade, right? So that's not a criticism either, okay? They have all the information they needed, okay? So this is the breakdown. The problem here is that there's other category. There are seven and eight cases that were not supposed to be in there on final path, such as small cell cancers and others. So considering that the number of recurrences is relatively small, if you excluded these, that could potentially change the findings. But I don't know, because we're not doing that. But that's stuff to keep in mind. Uh, tumor characteristics here, again, these are all appropriate, what we expect. Vaginal margin positivity rate, the same. Parametrial positivity, a little higher in the MIS group, but statistically the same. Again, because the recurrence is so small, even these small, non-significant differences could potentially impact the final results. We don't know. No, so the surgeons, are, I, I know most of the surgeons, many of the surgeons that ran, enrolled in that study. I know it was also uh, offered here in some Canadian sites. They're good surgeons, okay? You know, when we all talk about the radicality, the parametria, honestly, sometimes we do too much parametrial resection for some of these cases. We're talking about doing cone only for some of these cancers nowadays, you know what I mean? So, you know, you know they didn't measure parametria to know the extent of parametrial resection, but I doubt that that was the real reason, to be honest with you. The number of nodes removed was great in both arms. You know, these are just pelvic lymphadenectomies. So, you know, some might say, I, well, I get 50 nodes when I do a lymphadenectomy to the pelvis. All right, great, you get 50 nodes. So you cut them in half and then send them off to the pathologist, what let me tell you. <laughs> That's a way to increase your node count, by the way, is send off multiple little packets. <laughs> uh, no positivity rate is what we would expect and the same between the two. This is, uh, we all know the findings. This was the primary outcome. The disease-free survival of four years. The MIS group did not stay within the boundary, the non-inferiority boundary across that boundary, which means that we cannot say it's not inferior. All right? Also can't say it's inferior, but you cannot say it's not inferior, technically, from a non-inferiority study. And then they looked at it this way. I mean, the message is the same. If you just didn't look at sort of a superiority kind of analysis, looking at disease-free survival, there's a difference, of course, because it goes along with what we just saw. Overall survival, which is a little unusual, is also different. But if you go back, you know, the, the four and a half year disease free survival in the open arm was 96, 97%. I mean, they're basically curing everybody with open rat hiss, I guess. Um, so that's, it's much higher than expected. So that is a potentially valid criticism that just by chance alone, randomized trial is just a sampling of a population. So you can have random errors within a randomized trial, and just by chance alone, that that arm did better doesn't mean that's the reality in the real world, okay? So it's something to think about when you start interpreting these things. It's not, a, it's not that the trial was done incorrectly, just by chance, maybe that open arm did better for whatever reason. That happens. Happened with lap two also. The, the, the outcomes were better than expected too. So again, and the other thing too I understand is that pretty much everybody that recurred, they didn't salvage. I don't know about you guys, we do salvage uh, some patients with uh, when they recur, especially if they're local recurrences with radiation, occasionally an exoneration here and there. So it's a little unclear as to why every, almost every person that recur pretty much to come from their disease. 
Just another interesting thought. The recurrence is also here. Now, everyone's talking about uterine manipulators. I can tell you that most of these surgeons who are enrolled, especially when there's visible tumor, did not use manipulators because they never have, and many still don't, and many don't even use it for endometrial cancer. I do not think it's a manipulator problem. If it were, you'd see more cuff recurrences, and there's not. What there is is more pelvic, non-cuff, and abdominal multi-site recurrences, which starts to make me think that this is tumor mishandling being spread and distributed by CO2, so dissemination of tumor through the perineal cavity. And if you mess with the tumor visible enough, in enough cases, you'll have some of those cases have bad outcomes. It's true for sarcoma. It's true for most cancer surgeries. And I think that's the real problem with that trial. And if you look at laparoscopic videos, not to put down anybody, there's a lot of mishandling of visible tumor. You do the anterior copotomy, you pull up on that. There's no manipulator. So you pull up on that, and then you do the posterior copotomy coming across the tumor as you're doing that. You do that enough times, you're going to lop off some squamous cells that will then get blown around the, pe the peritoneal cavity. And then what happens? The specimen sits in the pelvis. I cringe when you see tumors sitting in on normal tissue, right? You don't take ovary cancer and smear it somewhere else where it's not, right? And then what happens to get it out? Somebody's trying to grab at it with a, a forcep or something, accidentally knock, knock, knocking off tumor cells. So I think that's the real problem. That's my thought. And actually, if you read the trial, this all, also an all or none approach in medicine is the worst way to do things. There's no such thing as all or none. You have to use some judgment and selection. I always love it that all your, when we do surgical papers, right, those cases are selected. Yeah, no kidding. I'm not going to operate somebody I don't think I, should, I can help. Of course they're selected. They're selected by my judgment, knowing that I can do something surgically. I don't just say, oh, close my eyes, service cancer, you get surgery. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And actually, if you read the paper, it says that you can extrapolate this to all cancers, especially the lower risk. Now, explain to me biologically, if you do a cone, and the margins are negative. Chance that there's any cancer in the uterus at the time of surgery is almost zero. Maybe fragile carcinomas, it's a little higher. Why would operating on an organ with no cancer in it have any impact on outcomes based on the technique? You're not manipulating anything because there's no tumor there. So somebody explain that to me. And I actually say that you can't extrapolate this to the lower risk, the less than two centimeters, no LVSI, all that stuff. Then this study. Now, this annoys the heck out of me when people say this is the confirmatory study. This is a retrospective national database study with as much whatever to it as any other retrospective study. And guess what? Our data at MSK is not part of any of these national registries. So this is not confirmatory of anything. It's as confirmatory as any other retrospective study would be. It's not. Anyway. So their design, they had an, it was a national, so we have a bunch of U.S. databases which not like other European countries, you know, it's only, it doesn't represent the entire, every single patient in the U.S. It's a representation of a fraction of the patient population. Not every center enroll, uh, puts people into these databases. There's the National Cancer Database, there's the SEER Medicare Database, which is run by the, can the, the, the NI, uh, NCI and all that stuff. So they took these retrospective databases at, from a national level. And I always love when you have to magnify a graph to give your point, because that's what that is in the inset because it doesn't look as impressive if it's at a normal scale. And they said in an NCDB database that the MIS was associated significantly with a worsened survival. But it's still within 4%, it's less than 4% difference, which would have been an acceptable difference. And if this was analyzed as a non-inferiority study, it'd be non-inferior. If this was the results of the LAC trial, we'd be saying it's not inferior right? But if you look at it as a superiority analysis, you're going to find with thousands of cases, you can find a minuscule difference to be statistically significant. You can do a trial large enough to get statistically significant findings. And if you measure by days instead of months, even like, more likely to find significance. You measure by minutes, forget it. Everything's significantly different. I'm getting agita. All right. So, <laughs> so from this database study, they suggest that less than two centimeters maybe not an issue, but again, it's a smaller subgroup. It has a wide confidence interval. Maybe there's a difference, maybe there's not. Then I love this one too. Again, it's a magnified graph. Look at where it starts. It starts at 50, not zero. So when you have to magnify things, you're really trying to pull something out of nothing, whatever. And of course, they sort of said that in, in the same databases, there was more MIS being done, and then there was a decrease in the overall survival. Still over 90%. This is overall survival. People could die from other things. 
Now, and what they also said, let me go back for they also said that, there was, that we were noticing an increase in survival in these patients. What were we doing from 2000 to 2006 that was different? What was different? Was there something different that you could even say we were improving their survival? It's only six years. There was nothing new out. This is not, there was no MIS being done according to them before 2006. So what, what the hell were we doing that you could even make say that it was going on? It could be a fluke in the data. This is the cancer-specific survival is not as impressive, so if they actually die of their cancer. And if you look at this, there's two time points in there that are higher than in the pre-laparoscopy group or pre-MIS group. And it ends in 2010 because I've tried to pull this out to get further because I have access to SEER also, and there's not enough follow-up to go past 2010 yet in the SEER database. I was hoping because the one, thing that, the one time point that really messed it up is that last one, okay? You put this on a regular graph, it doesn't look like there's a bit of difference anywhere to me. I mean, seriously, you show this, you're going to tell me that this is showing that we're, kill, we're hurting people? I don't know. Now, they also looked, uh, this is actually from an ASCO presentation all using the NCDB. Again, the whole concept that less than two centimeters, there may not be an issue, and if there is, it's the larger tumors. Again, going along with larger tumors being mishandled potentially during laparoscopy, possibly. The Koreans have this in press. You know, this is showing that they increased their laparoscopy rates from 2011 to 2014. They actually say that laparoscopy has a better survival. That the laparoscopy is on top. Now, I'm not going to go out. There's nothing that we're doing differently with laparoscopy, and obviously they have to account for maybe differences between the two groups and all that stuff. But I'm not going to say that laparoscopy is making people live longer either. Okay? But it's just data that's... This could be confirmatory. It's a retrospective national database from Korea. Why isn't this in the New England Journal? I don't know. This is just their adjusted, even on adjusting for various things, they still said that laparoscopy was associated with a better survival. I am not saying that, but it's just data that's out there that still gives me enough equipoise to have developed another randomized trial in the U.S. One randomized trial should not set standards for the rest of time. There's lots of examples of lots of randomized trials doing nothing to change clinical practice. Anybody here of IP therapy? Five randomized trials, NCI alert. I just saw I, a rate of IP therapy in that survey was 10%. I mean, but one randomized trial, that's it, we're done. We know the answer, we're finished. Danish, again, I'm going back to these guys. I love their databases. They capture every single patient, 97% coverage, every cancer. It's compulsory. You go to jail if you don't enter anybody. <laughs> again, they have a centralized system. It's a small country, right? It's like New Jersey. That's where I live. That's why I keep saying New Jersey. But, um, they have, that's six centers, uh, one, two, three, five centers that are the only ones who really do these surgeries. What you see here is how they've integrated MIS at each center over the years. The green is the introduction of robot, okay? So this is, they actually now, because they only include the truly eligible LAC cases, LAC itself at the end didn't have some case that should have been done anyway, plus there was no MRI imaging in any of those cases. I can tell you there were tumors that were definitely more than 1B1. So they just include this group, and you can see here the breakdown. These are thousands of cases, right? Between robot and open, there is absolutely no difference in recurrence or overall survival. The bottom line is it's a small number of laparoscopic cases they did, which suggests to me that they may have maybe messed it up a little bit as they were learning to do laparoscopy, which is challenging. But between the robot and open, no difference. This is our own experience, and we're updating this right now with one of our fellows who's uh, from Israel, Benny Brandt. He's uh, presented this, and we have a multi-center. We we're going to have about 1,400 cases from multiple centers in the U.S., um, and you know, that work is still ongoing, but we're updating this also. This is our disease-free survival, overall survival, and disease-specific survival at MSK. We looked at all our cases during the same time period for the same uh, lack of eligibility. There's no difference in median DFS, five-year disease-free survival, or overall survival. Actually, it seems to be better for the MIS group for overall survival, which I don't know why that is. I'm not going out there saying that, you know, open is going to hurt people either, but we see no difference. And in our MIS recurrences, and this is a group of 11, 12 surgeons. It's not just, we actually have individual surgeon outcomes, and right now we have to, every one of us has to disclose our own outcomes to every patient that comes in as they make decisions about MIS or open. In our MS group recurrences, there was a glassy cell carcinoma, which really wouldn't even be eligible, so we may even just remove that one, but that's one of our recurrences. And another one was a person who should have adjunct chemoradiation and didn't. So, you know, 
that would bring those curves even closer that you see on the left. That's the disease-free survival. And that's definitely within a 7% non-inferiority margin. So this is why at MSK, we still feel comfortable offering MIS. This is if we look at by size, again, no difference. Greater than two centimeters, the curves are a little bit different. So, you know, there were internal differences between surgeons. The overall survival, is, and the one all the way to the right is the disease-specific survival. The curves are on top of each other. Like I said, we can somehow salvage some of our recurrences. I don't know why in LAC they couldn't, but we can. That's why the disease-specific survival is the same. Overall survival is actually better for MIS. And we didn't include a couple of cases that left our institution with recurrence, went somewhere else, and then we got a death notice. I didn't include that in the disease-specific survival for open, and those were open cases. We have all the outcome on our MS, MIS cases because we've been tracking them very closely. So those who didn't get adjunct chemotherapy, again, not statistically significant, but you know, a slight difference there. But those who got chemo radiation, there's absolutely no difference in DFS or, or overall survival. Again, we're updating these data for, with more time, more, pa more patients, and more follow-up, and we'll see what, that, what those curves look like once we've updated it. What we didn't have is any recurrences in patients with 1A1 to 1A2 disease at all. And if there's no, no, no disease in the uterus, we had zero recurrences also, which makes sense. You're operating on an organ with no cancer. Who cares what kind of approach you do? So these are some of my humble thoughts about the LAC trial, if you haven't gotten some of them already. There is a random error rate with any trial. That's what power is all about. You can accept or reject your null hypothesis and still be incorrect because this is a sampling of a population. It's not the final answer. And every randomized trial has an error rate. Maybe this is one of those situations. How many examples do we have of 10 randomized trials saying one thing and one comes along and says it's something different? IP therapy, here we go again, right? Um, so, I, so based on everything I've said so far, there's truly enough to justify at least doing another randomized trial in this space. We cannot have it as just one trial is decided for the rest of us and all patients on the planet based on the bad outcomes at 14 centers in the world. That's unfair to us and our patients. It's not a manipulator issue like I mentioned. I really don't think that's the issue because most of these surgeons don't place a manipulator as a visible tumor. They've already knew that. We've all been worried about that, especially with cervix. It's not a radicality issue. I, don't, I really don't think it's related to the parametria, the vaginal and all that stuff. I really don't think it's a CO2 issue alone. But what I really think is a technique issue in mishandling, not purposefully, but being so excited about the MIS approach that you may have forgotten to be careful with that tumor. Now, at our place, we've never done, we've always done a circumferential clopotomy and pulled the specimen right out. There's no grabbing at it. As soon as the vag vaginotomy is done, it's pulled out, at least with my cases and with Dr. Sonoda. And in larger tumors, we'll do a vaginal clopotomy. So that's why, in some of our hands, I've had one recurrence in 12 years and no deaths. And I do them all robotic. So it's not selection that I do some open because they're harder or bigger. All my rat hiss in 12 years have been robotic. One recurrence, port site recurrence, two years after surgery, we resected it. She's NED six years later. That's it. Now, why would I change? Because, well, explain to me why, as I tell this to my patients, they're going to look at me, well, well, why are you going to change? My patients go home the same day after rat hiss now. 80% go home without Foley. That don't happen with open. So here's some of this uh, to justify this. So I've been looking through all the old CO2. There's lots of stuff on there, at mice and animals, and CO2 does this, that, or the other thing. Problem is, in animals, you've got tons of tumor in there, you're messing with it, and then you're blowing in air. Of course, it's going to be bad. This was kind of a nicer study. Again, I'm cherry picking, of course. This is my talk, and I decide what I want to show. <laughs> and I know there's lots of other, other side kind of papers out there, too, and I'm happy to discuss those with anybody. So what these guys did is they actually um, grew colonic adenocarcinoma cells into the spleen of mice through that posterior incision on the back there, okay, um, back here in this incision. They waited 10 days till the tumors grew. Then they did a subcostal incision on all the mice and put three trocars in. And then the ones that had tumors grown in the spleen, they randomized those mice to either control, where you did the spleen extracorporeally, the splenectomy, and then close the incision, and that's it. You had a, pneumo, a crush group where you did like this, no CO2, but you, you messed the hell out of the tumor in, in the belly, so you kind of crushed it inside the abdomen before you pulled it out. And then they did the same for pneumo, where they just basically exteriorize it. Now, there's some problems with this because it's not true pneumo with the organ inside kind of thing, where they actually did the spleen extracorporeally, then closed everything, then blew up the abdomen for 15, 
you know, 15 minutes with 50 millimeters of mercury. And then they did the same in the crush group, took out the spleen, closed everything up, and also instilled pneumo. I wish they kind of had just done it without exteriorizing it, but, you know, at least this is something to say that maybe I'm thinking the right way. And look what happens here. This is in a port site metastasis. Then they follow these mice and sacrifice them all about 10, 15 days later. The rate of port site metastasis was 70% in those who had crushed tumor without pneumo introduced, as well as those who had crushed and pneumo, whereas the other ones had the same rate. So I think really this lends a little more information that really it's a, a tumor manipulation issue. We have, to very, we have to go back to basic cancer principles of don't mess with a tumor. All right, when you operate, you, you take it out intact. You don't chop at it. You don't lop cells off, okay? That's why the morselator is a problem. It's not the morselator. It's the surgeon chopping up sarcoma, not realizing it. Morselator didn't do it. Morselator didn't decide to do it. There's also one about the whole vaginal colpotomy thing, which Dr. Sonoda, one of my partners, he does a lot of vaginal colpotomies for larger tumor. He's got a recurrence rate of 3%, 2%. He also has no deaths. So I can tell you there's only a few of us still doing MIS at our place. Um, so this is a retrospective from the Korean group. And um, they looked at intracorporeal colpotomy versus vaginal, and they, so they, they reported a lower recurrence rate in those that had a vaginal colpotomy. Now, whether it's a vaginal colpotomy or some other method, the point is that you're, they're being very careful with not allowing peritoneal spillage of tumor. It's basic cancer principle, guys. Surgery is not a drug. I've mentioned that already. Listen, we don't participate in those national databases. I tell Pedro all the time, you're MD Anderson. You say you're the best cancer care in the U.S., but then you're going to say your outcomes are the same as that database study? Then why would anybody come to you if that's the same outcome you have? No response to that one. So outcomes are different. It's known. There's tons of publications. There's differences. I'm going to show you some data now. It's a little controversial, but it's published on just cancer outcomes in general that they're not all the same at every place either. So to, to then extrapolate a randomized trial in which we did not participate in is a little unfair to ask us to do that. So again, the LAC trial, I give all credit to Pedro and the group. It's an internally valid study. Absolutely well done. Science is correct. Stop correctly, everything. What we're struggling with is external validity, which means how does it apply to me and my patients and to the rest of the world? That's what we're all struggling with. And it's made us all stop and think. I think everybody needs to stop and look at their outcomes and not just think that nothing bad is happening or that everything bad is happening. And again, an all or none approach for, for anything we do is not the way to do things, especially for cancer. And again, I, I hate to tell you, but not all surgeons can do the same thing nor have the same outcomes. That's just the reality. And here's an example of just cancer surgery. So this is a large study with thousands of patients using uh, Medicare, data, Medicare Medicaid database from the U.S. So there's, they use the U.S. World News Report, the top cancer centers. Many now in the U.S. the models, the cancer center has a bunch of affiliates, you know, MD Anderson South, MD Anderson North, MD Anderson Barcelona, all MSK this, that, and the other two, but whatever. And so, you know, you're assuming that by putting your name on a building, you're having the same quality outcome. And it should be based on, we're saying that one randomized trial dictates it for everybody, then it should be the same cancer outcome, right? These are for some cancer surgeries between top cancer hospitals and their affiliates and mortality within 90 days. Worse at all the affiliates who have that cancer center's name on their building. Worse. For lobectomy, colectomy, gastrectomy, esophagectomy, Whipple. Well, for the esophagectomy, it was almost significant. So these are all cancer center affiliated hospitals. And if surgery outcomes were the same, and we can extrapolate one randomized trial to everything, that's not true. Cancer surgery is not the same everywhere. I, 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 that's just the reality. Whether you like it or not, that's not my problem, but that's just the reality. This is just another graphical description of 90-day mortality. Orange is all the cancer centers, the, top, the 50 cancer centers that are top ranked in the U.S., and their affiliates, all worse their outcomes. Of course, you have some flukes on the bottom, and that's okay, too. And not every cancer center is the same, either, in terms of 90-day mortality. And this is just another adjusted odds ratio saying the same thing. Now, this is something that was published a few years ago, looking at cancer outcomes in general, not just surgery. This is comparing, and it's small, but PPS exempt. In the U.S., there's uh, 11 centers 
cancer centers that are called dedicated cancer centers, we're PPS exempt, so that means we get more money from Medicare to offer quality cancer care. That's, uh, that was an act of Congress in the 1970s when they put the whole uh, War on Cancer Act. There was 11 centers that were dedicated as, de as it was designated as dedicated cancer centers. We're one of them. And so we looked at outcomes for all cancers. Between those 11 centers, the NCCN comprehensive cancer centers that are not, and there's only 53 or 55 of those, that were not PPS exempt, and then the community, uh, academic centers, which don't have, they're not designated as comprehensive, and community. Those curves are in order of what I just said. Outcomes in all cancers were different at every institution with the best outcomes at the 11 dedicated cancer centers. So now I'm gonna take a randomized trial that I had nothing to do with and say that that's how I'm gonna do my practice? I don't think so. And these are, this is again who we are, the, the PPS. This is an act of Congress in 1971 when they did the National Cancer Act and dedicated 11 cancer centers, basically to allow us to get more money from Medicare instead of three cents on the dollar, 33 cents on the dollar, whatever it is, so that we can continue to offer the best cancer care possible. These are the 11 centers, none of which except for MD Anderson participated in the, in the LAC trial. And even MD Anderson didn't enroll a lot of patients, to be honest with you. They had no recurrences from all the, the ones I reviewed. And this is, again, just another way. This is looking at the 11 dedicated cancer centers versus all other facilities in terms of cancer outcome. And there's a significant difference in cancer survival if you come to one of the dedicated cancer centers. Again, the message being that cancer care and cancer surgery is not the same in everybody's hands. So that's why you have to be very careful extrapolating, especially cancer surgery trials, to your own practices. So what we do at MSK, we continue to follow our cases. We actually, every six months now, we identify every patient coming to our, our clinic with a cervix symptom. We have a dedicated research staff for that. We then update every six, anybody that goes to RAD, HIST, OPEN, or MIS, they, um, we fought, we, every six months we update to look for outcomes. And we have a very low loss to follow up rate at our institution. Abdominal approach, of course, is a, you know, if that's what you feel comfortable based on your interpretation of the data and your own personal outcomes and what you feel most comfortable doing, Absolutely do an open rat hiss. I'm not telling you not to. But, you know, MIS is also, and I really feel it should be just robotic because, you know, you know, and there's some folks probably do laparoscopic. I think there's some challenges with the instrumentations we're given for, for some of the more complex things. So at our place, we are allowing MIS to be offered by some of us and only robotic. We get a pre-op MRI on everybody. You know, we don't have a final path of eight centimeters size tumor on our database because everybody gets a pre-op MRI. This whole clinical exam to decide how you're gonna take care of a cervix cancer patient is ridiculous. That's like the rectal, colorectal guy sticking, doing a rectal exam and deciding if they're gonna operate or not, that's it. We have to stop that. Everybody needs a pre-op MRI, he's got cervix cancer. Now you can argue smaller things and all that stuff, but generally, visible tumors, doing a pelvic exam is not sufficient. That's like a head and neck surgeon sticking a finger in the mouth and saying I'm gonna operate or not, with no other imaging. Rectal surgeon too. It's routine for rectal cancer. So don't tell me you don't have MRIs at your institutions, because you all do. Every rectal cancer patient gets an MRI in this country. I mean, in the US. Maybe in Canada, I don't know, but I would assume so here, too. Now, the CT scan is plus minus. I'm not a big PET scan fan. Now, if you, if you have looked at the data, if you have an MRI and the tumor is less than four centimeters with no extra cervical extension, it's almost zero chance of finding extra pelvic disease. So if you have a pelvic MRI and a patient has a four, uh, less than four centimeter tumor with no other concern for spread, you really don't have to worry about a CAT scan, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. You can do it, but all we're requiring is a pre-op MRI. That'll at least cut off some of the costs of doing both scans. And I'm not a big PET scan fan for a lot of reasons, so I would never do those, but that's an additional cost also. So what we do now is stage 1A, 1A2. Basically, we're gonna keep doing MIS rat hiss the way we've always done it. We put a uter manipulator in those cases, we put stitches on the cervix, the colpotomy is done circumferentially around the cup that we use, and it's pulled right away as soon as the final colpotomy incision is made through the vagina. It doesn't sit in the pelvis whatsoever. For 1B1s, if they're a coronary lesion, same thing. We're gonna allow the same sort of approach. Less than two centimeter, non-visible, like a higher end of cervical cancer or something like that. We will, put still, again, basically the same thing. We will allow, put, put sutures on the cervix if there's normal cervix, and the manipulator, possibly, I think it depends, it's a case by case. Any tumor that's visible of any size, and all tumors over two centimeters, there will be no manipulator used. If there's normal cervix, we'll put sutures on there. 
And then we will do what we call tumor containment methods, and I can discuss those more later on. Those are the same ones we put into a new randomized trial. The easiest one is doing a vaginal colpotomy after the robotic dissection, like we do for trachelectomies, vaginal trachelectomies. It can be done. Most of us know how to do it, and if you don't, you can learn it in a day or two. So, so oh, here are some of the tumor containment methods. There's various things that we're uh, thinking about. You can actually staple across the vagina with the robot. You have to excise the staple line. It's not pleasant to have metal staples at the top of the vagina. But you can do that. By doing that, though, you wind up potentially taking more vagina. But it's a rat hiss, right? So there's your vag vaginal margin. So you can do that. Uh, others have talked about putting an endo loop around the vagina, if it's a small enough vagina, and endo looping it. So you're basically just containing the tumor before you make your colpotomy. And there's ways to do that. And I'm sure some of you can think of other ways, too. We truly feel that surgery is actually not appropriate. It's not that MIS, but surgery is really not appropriate for 1B2 or higher tumors. Chemo radiation. Those patients need radiation and chemo pretty much all the time anyway afterwards. So why bother? It's like head and neck cancers, rectal cancers. Chemo radiation is the standard. Why are we forcing large tumors into surgery? We don't. Just give them chemo radiation. They'll be cured just the same. You're going to give them chemo radiation anyway afterwards because they almost all have high risk features once they get above four centimeters. And this is the ROCK trial. This is currently at the, this is our current randomized trial design. We've changed it based on a lot of my talk here. Um, you know, everybody's going to be required to have a pre-op MRI, uh, and, you, and they all have to be less than four centimeters. They have to designate the tumor containment methods, and a lot of what I just mentioned in the talk is, is in the design of the trial. We have four interim analysis built in for safety, and by doing that, it's increasing the number to about 1,000 patients that we're going to have to randomize in this study as opposed to 700 in a LAC trial. So this will probably be funded by, uh, by Intuitive through the GOG Partners. It's our cooperative group system in the U.S., and... Um, Waiting to hear any day now. There are discussion between Intuitive and GOG Partners. That's how it works. We do the trial, we submit it, and then the GOG Partners works with the industry to figure out the money and the logistics, and they'll run it for us. Kristen Bixel from Ohio State is the PI on this. She's a junior faculty. We're helping her, you know, put this through. And Jeff Fowler and myself are the co-PIs. So right now it'll be just open when it opens to GOG Partner sites. If the, I know we have some Canadian sites that are. I don't, people from Canada who are on the GOG and NRG. So if uh, you are sites also and it's open, there's some surgeon qualifications. I don't have time to go over all the details. I have, it's a huge document. Happy to discuss personally with anybody. But if you are a GOG partner site and you meet the qualifications we've put in there, you'll be able to participate. So thanks. I could keep talking about this for days, but uh, hopefully this is enough. Yeah. You're welcome. A few minutes for questions from the floor. Come on, bring it on. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. That's very convincing. And, you know, I think we get it that, you know, when you do it, it's perfect. You know, the outcome's very good. But when you have a trial like this, the results have to be able to be generalized yeah. to the population at large. And it doesn't look like it does. I mean, a long time ago, uh, at the SGO meeting, when the study on uh, RADs versus pelvic nodes for positive groin nodes was closed prematurely for the same reason. Neville Hacker got up, and I can't do an Aussie accent, but he says, <laughs> when I do the pelvic node dissection, my patients do better. And, you know, therefore the study is flawed, but he can't do the surgery for everybody either. Yeah, no, that's a very valid point. That's why I'm not telling folks what to do. I'm telling you how we've looked at this, how we have interpreted it, and what we do at our institution. But the first thing we did was look at our own outcomes. And I can tell you that there's differences amongst the 11 of us where some are being asked not to do MIS or to have one, someone else there available to help out. So I think that what this has done is, yeah, you know, I think as a real world kind of a generalizable thing that something, something was done that created this result, right? Now we can't just say that's it, we're done with MIS. We have to stop and think about why that happened and how can we make it, what happened, if we can ever find out, and then how can we improve on that or do something to not let it happen again. So, but again, that, that, that comment of difference in outcomes, that's true for everything that we do in surgery. That's just a big problem with surgical trials. The external, they can be perfectly internally valid, like the lack is, but it's the external validity that's, that's the hardest thing to, to then know. Does it apply to the patients you see, to your own skill set? You know, and we all have groups with senior, junior faculty. We all know that there's differences. We have an Amplio system at MSK. It's, uh, it tracks all of our, we have a bunch of metrics. 
and it's updated, and we can actually see our own outcomes compared to the rest of the group. It's anonymized. You can see yours and you see the other bars, but you don't know who the other people are. And there's differences for everything we look at. How do you address that? You know? So even, with, even within a cancer center with, quote, unquote, the best human oncologists, there's differences in outcomes. You're not getting the same, unfortunately, sometimes, if you go to different people. And we all have that experience in our own groups. How do we make that better? You know, a surgeon who looks at data like that and says, well, I'm not really, I'm really kind of off the mark here. If you're conscientious, you'd want to make it better, you go find out. Maybe learn what you're doing or what the others are doing and try to improve your own sort of technique, maybe. So institutions that have done that have usually brought everybody up to the same level. Um, but it's a challenging thing to address. I mean, how do you address that on a global scale, right? I think I've, at least you have to look at your outcomes. And if you're not doing a lot of rat hiss, one, you probably shouldn't be doing them. But if you aren't doing a lot, then maybe it's the safest thing to just do it open for you. If you're, especially if you're not doing a lot of MIS stuff um, and you don't do a lot of rat hiss, it might be safer to do it open. So again, it's, it's, it's this all or none that we have to get away from. It's more of a learning what happened and, and, and you know, is it still appropriate in some people by some surgeons? Yes? Um, so you talked about differences in cancer outcomes, and we know well that there's differences in, in uh, outcomes in uh, different surgeons. So can we really say it's valid when that hasn't been controlled for in the study? So um, we look at bariatric outcomes in, in Michigan, like that was, you know, peer assessed surgical skill yeah. based on video. So, so how do we actually design a study, or how are you going to do a study that, that controls for that when it's such a significant factor in, in, in outcomes in, in every field so far? Yeah, uh, I, I love to hear ideas, because we've struggled putting this rock child together. You know, so we are not even asking for submission of videos, because we all know it's just the best video you have. You're not going to show the crappiest case you ever did with a not-so-perfect technique. So. We're not even asking for videos. We just asked for a number of cases and they have to send us their outcomes. It's more than 10. We're asking for that you've done at least 30 rat hiss and what the outcomes are. Um, ideally, like I mentioned, the only way to really ascertain sort of surgeon uh, technique differences or similarities would be to video every case. We looked into that. That's a lot of extra money. Um, and logistically, it's a little bit of a nightmare with a 1,000 potential patients being randomized across multiple centers in the U.S. I could do it at my place, no problem. We have an internal video capturing system. Not everybody has that. You know, so if anybody has any brilliant ideas of how, better, how to do it better, the protocol is still able to be developed. It's still in development, so we can still modify things. And if anybody can think of anything to sort of better qualify or assess the similarities in technique, I'd be happy to hear it and add it into the protocol. Uh, she was first. Thanks. Um, I actually just wanted to follow that last comment, um, which was about surgeon experience and how we account for that in many of these studies. And um, we act, I'm speaking on behalf of the group from UHN, so I'm, I'm a resident and a PhD candidate here at U of T. And uh, we actually just looked at um, outcomes in Ontario. So we did a population-based study encompassing all women in Ontario who've had cervical cancer and undergone radical hysterectomy in the last decade. Um, and our paper's currently under review right now, but we, in Ontario, we have availability and access to surgeon billing data, so we can see exactly how many radical hysterectomies a surgeon has done um, leading up to the procedure that they've performed, what that diagnosis was for. So we were able to look at surgeon volume for uh, the specific technique, so the technique they selected, whether that was minimally invasive or open, and also looking at the volume of cervical cancer cases that they perform. And even after controlling for surgeon volume in both of those factors, we still saw a twofold increase in all-cause death and recurrence for patients with stage 1B disease. We didn't see any differences in patients with stage 1A. So it sort of alludes to what you were saying in terms of uh, microscopic versus gross, but we still saw that difference even after accounting for individual surgeon differences in um, experience and volume. So I just wanted to add that point on to. Sure. And we looked at, I had one of my fellows too has been presented to, we looked at our NCDB, we took the NCD, no, the SEER database, and we also show that increasing hospital volume, surgeon volume, was associated with decrease, an improvement in, in uh, survival in service in rat hiss cases. Mm -hmm. Still a slight difference between MIS and open, but a huge difference in those who did more in terms of better outcomes. Yeah. Now the thing is this, if it's a technique issue and no one ever, this was never brought to light, it doesn't matter if you do one or 100 cases, if your technique is always the same in terms of tumor 
spillage, then you always have, it won't matter how many cases you've done if you're still spilling tumor every time you, you do the surgery. So, you know, that's why it's one of those things that we never really thought would be a problem. Now, now we have to stop and think, you know, and I bet you if some of those surgeons maybe were a little more careful, then maybe the outcomes might be different. But if you're doing the same sort of technique in terms of how you manage that tumor and do that colpotomy and take it out mm -hmm. over 100 or one case, you're going to have the same outcome. Yeah. Right. So something to consider too, but that's great. And I don't know if you yeah. share the paper I, with me. I think the point, the, the other thing to, I, I completely agree with you in terms of different people have different techniques, but you have to think of how it will be generalized. So yeah. if, if you're saying one individual person may have good technique, but a big trial or big population-based studies that reflect real world practice are still showing these harms, even if in a very explanatory trial where you're controlling for all of these things, like you're proposing, shows no difference, we have to think of how that also would be generalized. Right. So I think the LAC trial and some yeah. of these population-based studies do reflect sort of real-world practice. That's a valid point, and I think that's why what we're, done, what we're doing in this trial is going to be general. It's not, we didn't do rocket science stuff. You know, we're making it, everybody getting a pre-op MRI, which in LAC they didn't. Not a single person had an MRI. All the reviews, I had all the pre-op imaging, they were all just CAT scans, okay? So the ones that had a CAT scan. So, none, so we're, MRI, that's generalizable. And then, you know, for the small tumors, you basically can do still whatever you like. It's the visible tumors where you do a colpotomy or contain the tumor. Very generalizable, in my mm -hmm. opinion. If we find no difference, then yeah. I think what I've been thinking might have been correct, and that now we can say, be more freaking careful when you operate, yeah. especially when there's a visible tumor. So I think that none of this was never brought to light before because we all thought everything was fine, hunky-dory. We never even thought about this. So whoever was doing these rat hits was doing them the same the whole time. And some thought it was a problem and were very careful. Others thought there was no problem and just did whatever and did it the same way for 100 cases. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's all interesting stuff to put in. If you can send me the paper, I'll include it in here when I give my talks too. That sounds like a wonderful analysis. Thank you.